So guys, please subscribe to the channel and please smash the like button on this video. So guys, in this next news story, nine people have been convicted of murder after a Nottingham man was fatally stabbed in a case of mistaken identity. Michael Anton O'Connor, may he rest in peace, was attacked outside a property in Meadows shortly after 10.20pm on the 10th of November 2021. The 31 year old from Alexandra Park died at the Queen's Medical Centre after police found him collapsed on the pavement. A subsequent police investigation found the murder was a culmination of a drug war which had broken out between two rival organised crime groups, each vying for control of the local drugs market. Michael was well known and well liked in the area and was tasked with calming tensions between the two gangs. However, his killers mistook him for their intended target which was a Nottingham drugs kinping and cost Michael his life. In October 2022, 11 people went on trial at Nottingham Crown Court, accused of his murder and today nine of those defendants were found guilty of murder. They include Benjamin Taylor, who's 38 of Manchester. He sent a team of dealers from Manchester down to Nottingham to carry out the murder. Leonard Ward was 42. He was based in the organised crime gang that ordered the killing. Joseph Boscombe, from Manchester was part of the hit team sent to carry out the murder is 41. Joshua Agbula is 30. He was part of the hit team that was sent out to carry the murder is from Blackburn. Carla Maguire is 53. She lived at the property next to where Mr O'Connor was murdered and she was accused of turning off a CCTV at her property just before the attack was carried out. She was also linked to a gang base in Nottingham. Michael Mingos from Manchester. He was part of the hit team sent out to carry the murder and he's the man believed to have dealt the fatal blow. There was Jerome Sherd. He was Leonard Ward's right-hand man and the son of Carla Maguire, and he was a member of the Meadows-based organised crime group that organised the killing. There was Paula Usherwood, who was 39. She set up the ambush by meeting the intended target on the morning of the murder. There was a Michael Maguire, who was 35, and he's the son of Carla Maguire and lived at the property next to where the murder took place. There's two other defendants who also went on trial for other offences related to the murder. There was Kerry Ann Shepherd, 35, denied assisting an offender but was found guilty. There was Gemma Fearing, who's 38, of Macclesfield, which denied a charge of encouraging assisting the commission of an indictable only offence and she had been accused of driving the hit team to and from the scene of the murder and was also found guilty by the jury. There was a Rebecca Bell and Curtis Shared and they were both found not guilty of murder and the guilty defendants are going to be sentenced next week. Following the verdicts, Assistant Chief Constable Rob Griffin of Nottinghamshire Police said firstly, our thoughts with Michael's family who have had to endure such a tragic and traumatic event. As someone who was well known and well liked in the Meadows area, Michael was asked to act as a peacemaker with two feuding gangs and it cost him his life. He was ambushed by a number of masked up men who were heavily armed with a gun, a sword, a knife, axe and a hammer. Michael was unarmed and his killing was therefore cowardly in the extreme. Following his murder, those responsible went into self-preservation mode, hiding and removing items that could incriminate them, lying to detectives and trying to create the impression they were trying to assist as Michael lay on the ground dying. They fooled no one and today's verdicts are a testament of the enormous amount of work that went into bringing Michael's killers to justice. Detective Chief Inspector Rob Routledge read the investigation and said, he also welcomed the verdicts and said these nine defendants denied their involvement in this horrific crime. But a jury have heard the evidence gathered by the investigation team and found them guilty. Ahead of their sentencing, I would like to thank the members of the jury who for 29 weeks listened to the evidence surrounding this brutal attack on the witness who have supported this prosecution, particularly those who gave evidence during the trial. I would also like to thank our colleagues within the CPS and the prosecuting counsel for the manner in which the case had been prepared and delivered at trial. And lastly, I must thank the dedicated team of officers and staff from across the region's five police forces who worked around the clock on this investigation and who have shown great skill and professionalism throughout. I hope the manner in which this murder has been dealt with, with today's verdicts, will reassure the public that the police service will act quickly and robustly to bring violent criminals to justice. So opening the trial last October, the prosecutor, Adrian Langdale Casey, said Michael had been the victim of a brutal, pre-planned ambush and that he died from a stab wound to the heart when his killers mistook him for their intended target, which was a Nottingham drugs kingpin. He said Michael had been sent to Wilfred Crescent by the kingpin, who had been invited there for talks, 
to resolve the escalating war. Prosecutor told the jury Michael went unarmed and was seemingly unaware that he was heading into a trap which was set for the kingpin. The prosecutor told the jury instead of meeting to calm tensions, a carefully planned and organised ambush awaited him at the hands of a number of heavily armed males, seemingly keen on settling the dispute once and for all and who didn't care a jot whether it was the primary target they attacked or simply someone connected to him. Whilst evidence suggests Michael Mingos pulled a knife into Michael's heart during the ambush, Mr Langdale said the murder had been a joint act by numerous individuals. He said each in turn may just as well have also had their hands on the handle of the knife. It was intended to be carefully planned and organised hit by a drug dealing organised crime group based in the meadows. But instead of doing the dirty work entirely by themselves, they had concluded they had become outgunned by the rival gang and felt they needed to bolster their strength by hiring in muscle from Manchester to carry out the attack. The court heard Leonard Ward and his right-hand man, Jerome Sherd, organised for Ward's upstream supplier, Benjamin Taylor, to send out a team of dealers down from Manchester to act as the hit team. This team included Joshua Agbula, Michael Mingos and Joseph Boscombe, with Gemma Fearon tasked with driving them to and from the murder scene. The killings took place outside the home address of Carla Maguire and her sons, Michael Maguire and Curtis Sherd. Also, 11 defendants charged with Michael's murder, which was arranged only hours before it took place. The court heard Paula Usherwood held a brief lunchtime meeting with the leader of a rival group at a pub in the Meadows, with CCTV showing her doing most of the talking. The court heard Usherwood use the meeting to give the impression she wanted to reduce tensions and issues between the two gangs when her actual motive was to set up the rival leader so that he would be killed. Mobile phone data revealed numerous phone calls took place on the same day involving Paula Usherwood, Michael Maguire, Jerome Sherd and Leonard Ward, all later charged with Michael's murder. On the afternoon of the murder, Joseph Boscombe, Michael Mingos and Joshua Agbula travelled from Manchester to Nottingham by car. CCTV showed them stopping off at a shop in Stafford to buy clothing including a zip-up black night top, which was identical to the one later found by police at the address of one of the suspects. The trio continued to Wilfred Crescent West, the scene of the murder, arriving at R4 and CCTV showed them getting out of a Toyota Yaris carrying rucksacks and being greeted by Michael Maguire who was wearing a stab vest before going into a house. On the same afternoon, Benjamin Taylor made the same journey from Manchester in a white Audi. The court heard Taylor met with Leonard Ward in the West Bridgeford area so that he could receive payments for the murder later that day. Meanwhile, CCTV captured Paula Usherwood and Michael Maguire coming and going from the area around Wilfred Crescent West and the General Meadows area. At 10 past 10, Paula Usherwood and the men who had arrived earlier in the Toyota Yaris left the house on Wilfred Crescent West and appeared to be armed. A minute later, the CCTV at the address was turned off and it is believed the stabbing took place around 10 minutes later. Previous footage prior to when the camera was turned off was also deleted, although officers were able to recover it. At 10.17, Michael was captured on other CCTV, taking what turned out to be his final steps, along with the footage showing him walking in the direction of his brother's flat along Batley Street minutes before he was killed. Following the murder, Paula Usherwood drove his attackers away from the murder scene and inquiries after the killing led officers to search the home of Rebecca Bell, who was captured on CCTV with several of the murder suspects on the day Michael was killed but has today been cleared off murder. Her home was searched on the 13th of November and officers found a bag containing three ballys, three pairs of gloves and black night top. A knife and axe were also found under the bed and forensic tests detected DNA belonging to Joshua Agbula and Joseph Boscombe on the balaclavas and they went on to be charged with the murder along with multiple others. So guys, this is a new story coming from Nottingham Showways. Just want to say, rest in peace to the victim, Michael Anton O'Connor, and my condolences go out to your family. So guys, what was the roles of those that have been convicted? So Benjamin Taylor, he was a Manchester drug dealer, and according to the prosecution, he frequently paid and arranged for defendant Gemma Fearon to make trips from Manchester to Nottingham to deliver wholesale quantities of drugs to Leonard Ward. Prosecution would say that it is more salient in the pattern of calls between Leonard Ward and Benjamin Taylor. Benjamin Taylor was being kept in the loop over the deteriorating situation in Nottingham. Ward arranged for Taylor to send a team from Manchester to act as a hit team. He was found guilty of murder. Leonard Ward, by his own admission, Ward was selling high-grade cannabis called Cali from California at the time of Mr O'Connor's death. The prosecutor 
had told the jury that there was no doubt he was a significant dealer of the drugs. He said this was predominantly a war about Class A drugs. This was a war about crack cocaine and heroin and not cannabis. Ward shed some light on what was rumbling on in the background in the meadows. He said in the interview a group of lads was bullying everyone. People had been getting guns pulled on them and knives pulled out on them. He eventually accepted the person he was referring to in all this was the rival dealer. Ward, whose boards up in St Anne's, denied in his evidence to the jury that he was head of an organised crime group. He was also found guilty of murder. You've got Jerome Sherd. He was the partner of the defendant Kerry Ann Shepherd, and the prosecution had suggested Sherd was the right-hand man at the top of this organised crime group with Leonard Ward. Sherd, a joiner from Derbyshire, was directly in contact with members of the hit team, it was alleged. Sherd organised for Ward's upstream supplier, Taylor, to send the team from Manchester, but Sherd told the jury in his evidence it would be a ridiculous idea when asked about being alleged party to setting up a rival dealer to be ambushed, attacked or killed. Michael Mingos, he's said to have stabbed Mr O'Connor and he denied ever having hold of the knife and said to have been produced by Mr O'Connor for making a stabbing motion. He was aged 20 and he said his parents were religious and strict. He got a scholarship to go to private school and he did very well. One day when he was 16 he was stabbed and he was left with a scar on his head. However, the jury also found out that at the time he told the hospital he was injured as a result of playing football. He said he got paranoid as a result of the attack and took a year out of college. He got mixed up with criminals in rush home in Manchester and drug dealing. And Mingos then started dealing when he was 18 and worked for a man called Bones, dealing heroin and crack, but Bones had sacked him. He confided in Boscombe about his financial difficulties and he ended up owing Boscombe money. Boscombe, he said, contacted him about needing a runner in Nottingham and this was his opportunity to work on the line and Mingo said he was not aware of the feuds in Nottingham again he was found guilty of murder. He got Boscombe. He came to Nottingham on November the 10th 2021 and was driven there by the defendant Gemma Fearon. He was in the company of Mingo's and Joshua Agbula. His case was his action was in relation to drugs and not of violence and threat of violence. He was the one who directed Mingo's to hand himself into the police with a prepared statement. Mingos had told the jury he was afraid to go back to Boscombe and police declined to take him back into custody. Jerome Sherd's evidence was Boscombe came to Nottingham to supply cannabis but the prosecution said there was no drugs relationship between Boscombe and Jerome Sherd before. They said the suggestion there was such a relationship was made up in order to disguise the truth of the visit which was not a routine delivery but on the prosecution's case the delivery of a hit squad. The prosecution also said that Boscombe was one of the ones who went out with Jerome Sherd and later on was on one of the bikes as part of what the prosecution suggested was a reconnaissance mission as part of a planned attack. The defence said these trips were more likely to be visits to drug dealing spots. The prosecution also said that Boscombe was the man who assaulted Jack Coxon so Mr Coxon encountered masked men who attacked him near to where the killing happened. It was alleged Boscombe attacked him with a gun and after Mingo's allegedly stabbed Mr O'Connor and the Manchester men were whisked away from the Nottingham by Jerome Sherd it was Boscombe who called Benjamin Taylor several times after their retreat from the city. Joshua Agbula. The prosecution said Agbula was one of the three men recruited by Benjamin Taylor to attack the rival dealer. And they also alleged on the evidence of Michael Maguire, Agbula was a Class A drug dealer and a friend of Boscombe. He was on the reconnaissance trip on bike for the ambush that was to follow. Agbula wore a balaclava and was in the company of Michael Maguire. And he, along with others, was allegedly one of those who was surrounded and blocked Mr O'Connor and was doing this at the time Mr O'Connor was stabbed to death. In interview, the prosecution said Agbula was following a lie designed by Boscombe and Mingos to present a false picture, said the judge. Agbula said he came to the party in Nottingham and it was Mingos' idea. He denied wearing a balaclava or ski mask found in a bag at the alleged safe house. Carla Maguire, so her address was also the home to her sons, Michael Maguire, who ran the MI line in Curtis Sherd. The third son, Jerome Sherd, was registered at the address, but he lived with his partner, Kerry Ann Shepherd, who denied assisting offender at the trial before the murder. The address was the meeting point for some of the defendants, including the hit team sent from Manchester. Minutes before the killing, the CCTV at the house was turned off and prosecutors said Carla Maguire controlled the CCTV from her phone. The trial also heard she told police at the scene the camera was a dummy and this was not true. The CCTV was installed according to the prosecution shortly after the release of the rival dealer from prison. She was present on the doorstep of her home when the men from Manchester arrived. She was also outside when the bikes for the Manchester men arrived. 
the defence made the point that there was no spikes or unusual call activities. There was Paula Usherwood. So Usherwood was Carla Maguire's niece and she set up her phone to link to the newly installed CCTV at the house. She was present on October the 26th at the Poets Corner pub when there was the clear the air meeting the trial heard. She was seen approaching the rival dealer at the time. The prosecution said this was setting up of the ambush at Wilfred Crescent West later that evening and the defence suggested she not luring him but warning him to stay away. Later that day, she visited the address after the Manchester men arrived. She and repeated phone contact with Jerome Sherd, Leonard Ward and a third male in the aftermath of the alleyway stabbing. She was outside when the bikes were being arranged. She was in contact with the rival dealer and the prosecution say this was to confirm the meeting was still on. She allegedly drove Michael Maguire and the three defendants to Boswell Park, which is in the Meadows. She allegedly drove back at what appeared to be some considerable speed as Mr O'Connor was seen to be walking in the opposite direction and the four passengers were dropped off. Her evidence was that, not that she spoke to Mr O'Connor before she sounded a home. The prosecution said this was to summon the four men, the hit team, and after the stabbing she told the three Manchester men to get in their car and drove them to the alleged safe house in the Meadows where they removed their gloves and balaclavas. It was Michael Maguire. The prosecution said he was the controller of the MI line and he was there to receive the men from Manchester at his own. He was allegedly wearing a stab-proof vest when they arrived, but he said it was a Stone Island jacket. He spent most of the hours before the attack in the company of the Manchester men at the address. He took them out on the bikes, it was claimed, and he was with Boscombe when the robbery happened on Mr Coxon. Maguire disputed the robbery and he was allegedly wearing a balaclava and gloves, which ended up at the safe house later. So guys, this is a new story coming in from Nottingham Showways. Once again, I just want to say, rest in peace, Michael. And my condolences go out to your family. It's your boy GC. Keep it locked. Keep it real.